Welcome to the MMHP and the 989, channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history. Hello, Michigan music lovers. This is Scott Baker. I want to welcome you to the Michigan Music History Podcast. I am flanked by Michigan Music Royalty. To the left, Dr. J. To the right, Sir Fred. We cut from just around the block of the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in Bay City, Michigan, here at Studio 163 in Essexville. And now it's time to grab a favorite beverage, hit the cruise, and take a trip back with us through Michigan's rich music history. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric, Electric Kitsch, Kitsch, located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. And now, here's your host, Scott Baker. And we're back for part two with the great Kevin Cole, Bay City's own heir to Gershwin. We want to thank Kevin for making the trek to Studio 163 here in Essexville, and also for Kevin's absolute vast knowledge of the area, the world, and all the music spots that tickle the fancy of many listeners. He has a huge fan base throughout the world, and uh, we are so grateful to have him here in our state, let alone our mid-Michigan area. And in this episode, part two here, we're going to have Kevin give us a little bit of insight on the last 10 years or 15 years or so, and take us into the future of what it holds for him, uh, what he's been through, and what he continues to deliver and have on his deck in the coming years. So without further ado, Kevin Cole, episode two. Now, you did this when you're still living in Bay City? Yeah. Well, what prompted you to move to Chicago then? Uh, well, let's see. My first move, actually, away from Bay City was in 1980. 1980? Let me think about that. 80, 81. Yeah, 81, 82. What, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky. And that happened because... <laughs> kind of a strange coincidence, I guess, how it happened. Mrs. Jones, the woman I just talked about, a former voice teacher at Interlochen, was from Harrodsburg, Kentucky, and, which is central Kentucky. And uh, when I graduated from Interlochen, she asked me if I'd ever been, been to Kentucky. I said, no. So well, you should see the bluegrass. And I said, okay. So I went with her. I said, We're gonna, I'll go down. And I spent a week there. And then she decided to retire there. But before doing that, she took me to a place called the Beaumont Inn, which is still there. And they had this beautiful African Rosewood 1880s Steinway in the parlor. And so she said, oh, you should play something because she knew, you know, knows the owners. This is her hometown, knows everybody. And so I did. And uh, so that every once in a while, I'd go down to Harrodsburg. And then in 19... 19- 80, John Y. Brown became governor of Kentucky, and he was married to Phyllis George, former Miss America, mm-hmm. who was one of the first women sportscasters right. for CBS. I remember her very well. Okay. Well, since piano was her talent for Miss America, Mrs. Jones got it in her head that um, they should have me come and play for their parties at the governor's mansion or whatnot. So she said, we're going to take a trip to Frankfurt uh, capital of Kentucky. It's okay. So we go there. She meets the chief of staff and I'm out on an outer office waiting and I became very good friends with this chief of staff, Liz Dahl. And, and years later, Liz would say, here's this woman who just wouldn't take no for an answer. She goes, you got to hear Kevin play. You have to. Phyllis really needs to hear Kevin play. And she wouldn't let go of it. So finally, Liz says, okay. So we walked over to the really old governor's mansion next to the Capitol. And they had this piano. Very, it looked like a Louis the Fourteenth, all painted. and I mean, <laughs> just unbelievable piano. And it, it probably hadn't been tuned since Martha Washington played the piano. <laughs> it was horrible. It sounded like there were fly swatters on top of the hammers. It was just awful. <laughs> so she's holding up Liz, the chief of staff for John White Brown and Phyllis George, this little micro cassette, you know, not a dictaphone, but you know what I'm talking about, like a voice mm. recorded thing. Mm-hmm. So she's holding it up, and I play my Gershwin medley. Two weeks later, I get a phone call back here, back in Michigan, from Liz Dahl saying, how would you like to play for uh, Governor John White Brown and Phyllis George's first derby party? 
right. Let me tell you who the guests are going to be. And she said it wrong. Jimmy Carter, um, Roger Staubach, Muhammad Ali. Uh, yeah, she just went on this whole list of uh, Armand Hammer, uh, Walter <laughs> Cronkite, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, how's that sound? I said, what do I need to do? She goes, well, Phyllis has her Baldwin grand that she got for Miss Amer- being Miss America in her back family room of their mansion. Not the governor's mansion, but their private residency at Cave Hill. So uh, would you like, to, you know, you would just play music, you know, for three, four, five hours or whatnot. I said, fine. So to, to condense the story, because there's, there's a lot to these stories, but to condense it, the day of it, because uh, I drove down from Michigan, um, I show up an hour early. I, actually, maybe a little more than that. And Phyllis is about seven months pregnant at the time. It's a beautiful home, and there's a big screen door. I mean, these columns, the whole bit. And I go up to the door, and I'm kind of knocking, hello, hello, anybody there? And all of a sudden, this woman is coming forward, and she's absolutely radiant. I mean, just because Phyllis George is a beautiful woman. But she comes forward, and she goes, are you Kevin? And she's from Denton, Texas. She goes, are you Kevin? I said, yeah. She goes, well, hi, I'm Phyllis. And we shook hands, and she says, oh, I'm going to love this. She says, as you can see, I'm not ready. So if you want to warm up a little bit, I would love it while I'm getting ready. And couldn't have been nicer. So from that, and then there's a story about Muhammad Ali and I sharing the piano bench, but that's another story. But but from that one, then they started using me for all of their private events um, at the governor's mansion. She had, when Walter Cronkite retired from CBS, she had a private dinner for 18 guests, like some of the wealthiest people on the planet. They flew me down to play you know, for that it, same you know, at their home, and and then I played at the last derby party because you know he was in office for four years, and that's interesting because Andy Warhol was at that one. Wow! And somewhere in his millions of photos he took, and dumb me, I should have contacted him right away. He took he took pictures of me playing the piano, and I actually spoke with Andy Warhol when he wasn't speaking to anyone at that derby party. He had donated some kind of lithograph of something like uh, his interpretation of the Kentucky Derby to be auctioned off. And they have these giant, this giant white tent to seat 400 people for this derby party. And they had peacocks on the lawn and orchestra playing on the front lawn. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's like gone with the wind. It was mm. crazy. So I took a break from playing inside, but while I was playing inside, I knew he, he sat right behind me for a long time. He had two bodyguards with him. And he had his camera around his neck because, you know, he's notorious for taking pictures of everything. And at one point, he went to the butt end of the piano and started taking some pictures while I'm playing. And I'm thinking to myself, Andy Warhol's taking my picture. Okay, this is surreal. <laughs> this is what? And I remember I was wearing it because, you know, this is 1981. Um, I'm wearing this uh, cream colored suit with a brown collar, probably with a little gold chain because. That was, you know, you have to look like Saturday Night Fever. Um, and so he, he leaves and he just scurries off. And so there's a derby brunch the next day and I'm to play for that. So I go outside on a break in this big white tent and it's, she's got a stage set up and she has up with people performing and it's just all wholesome and apple pie And then Phyllis gets up, oh, Andy Warhol's here and he's got this, oh, we're going to auction off this beautiful, Andy, why don't you come up here and say a few words? He comes up. Nothing. She goes like this with the mic. Nothing. He's just standing there. <laughs> okay, just like blankly. Like, well, you know, Andy's. Just, I I know what Andy would tell you. He's just enjoying this time. Yeah. So she's like filling in. Like, boy, he's just standing there. So I am like bound and determined to meet him. Mm-hmm. All right, and maybe get him to sign something. I don't know. So I line myself up at the back of this big tent because they have rows of banquet tables. I line myself up with one of the rows that I think when he leaves the stage, she's going to come down. I'm just guessing. But I'm thinking he's going to, okay? It's like pinball. You pull it and you hope it goes down one <laughs> of those lanes. Okay, here comes it. Sure enough, it comes right down my lane. And I pull, I, they had a kind of a one-page program menu kind of thing, events of the day on all the tables. I grabbed one and I said, Mr. Warhol, would you mind signing this for me? And he took my pen. And he starts signing. He stops me and he looks up at me and he goes, you're the young man who was wearing the three-piece cream-colored suit yesterday at the piano. I said, yes, I am. Finishes signing, hands it to me, walks off. And I went, 
he spoke to me. <laughs> he wouldn't speak to Phyllis and all these hundreds of people, but he spoke to me. So dumb me, I should have, because I could have through the governor's office, obviously they know how to contact him and say, hey, is there any way I could get a copy or you know, print of that picture? Because somewhere in the files... Oh, my Lord. Now, I, they, he was very meticulous about labeling things, so they just have to look at the Kentucky Derby, but I would love that picture. Again, dumb me. I could have said, Mr. Warren, would you just sign that photo and send it to me? Because, oh. But I got the memory. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's just, again. That picture's somewhere. It's somewhere. <laughs> it's, 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 it's in some whatever file. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's the power of music because... Uh, but he was so observant of everything. But apparently, I yeah. mean, he could have just brushed me off. But he just that. Well, this leads you then the success you were having prompts you to go to the big city. Then is that well where this is coming to? I moved to Louisville for a year because they were having me come down so much uh, to play private events that the chief of staff, Liz Doss, said, "Did you consider moving down here?" She goes, "I know there's a, there's a dinner club, a uh, play or uh, restaurant." Uh, that has a jazz trio that's leaving. It's called the Captain's Quarters. And she's, you know, you should come down and audition for them. And because that's this way you'd have the job, and then we could use you when we want to. So I did. And I got that gig. I played six nights a week from 7 to 1 a.m. Wow. Had Mondays off. And it was yeah. quite a gig. Yeah, yeah. And I would take requests. And uh, good pay, too. Well, it was enough for me to, yeah, to afford an apartment and, and be in Louisville. Um, I remember when I moved down there, it was Labor Day weekend, and come to, what was the uh, beginning of November, they had their first little bit of snow. And I'm talking, we, would, <laughs> we wouldn't even blink. And they don't know how to drive in it. They were just all over the place. I'm like, I have five miles to go from my apartment to, to work. So, how in the hell? I mean, these people in front of me, somebody's going to kill me. It's not going to be my fault. They don't know how to drive and just like, this teeny bit of snow. Oh. But anyway, from there, I moved back here. And then uh, 1990, I moved out to L.A. Because I knew how things went in New York, but I didn't know how things went in L.A. So I moved out to L.A. for a year. Uh, that was interesting. I had enough money for six months. But then I started getting hired as a sub to play at some of the big hotels because um, of course, I don't find just any apartment. I find an apartment in Beverly Hills. Mm. And in 1990, you know what my rent was a month? Okay. 1990. Even today, this would be considered kind of high for rent. I was paying $920 a month for rent. <laughs> and it wasn't a fancy apartment by any means, but it was right across the street from the famous Chase's Restaurant. <laughs> and back in the day, there used to be a Folgers Coffee ad. These people don't know it, but they, if it's, you know, Chase's Restaurant, they just had a $400 meal, but they're being served Folgers Coffee. I'm thinking, okay, how dumb can these people be? <laughs> <laughs> they can have this elaborate meal, but they don't know, you know, 50 cent coffee? Come on. Yeah. But anyway, that was the big commercial for famous Chase's. And that's where all the celebs went. So I lived right across the street from that. And I said to myself, as I'm moving in, in 1990, Labor Day weekend, I said, wouldn't it be something if my first gig was playing at Chasen's Restaurant? Two weeks to the day I moved in, I threw on my text, I'm playing for an NBC party in honor of Red Buttons, the comedian. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> you got to watch what you say. You can say it in your head all you want. It's when you say it out loud. Sometimes the cosmos goes, well, we're going to give him that one. That's kind of fun. <laughs> oh, you know? oh, man. But, but from that, the guy that hired me was a friend of Liz Dahl, the chief of staff from Louisville, from, oh. from the government. She knew one person out there when she heard I was moving out there. She goes, oh, you should look, look, contact my friend Bob Nunu. He's a lawyer for NBC. So she had told him about me, and he's the one that called me at the part when I just moved in and said, we're having this party. It's at Chase's. I said, I'm right across the street. Fine. After that party, he said to me, do you know anybody out here? I said, yeah, I know one classmate from Interlochen, uh, Terry Harrington, whose father is Pat Harrington. Do you remember that comic who was on One Day at a Time playing Schneider? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But he was also from the old Steve Allen show and all that stuff. Well, his son Terry is a phenomenal uh, jazz pianist and composer. He lives, well, he's in Tucson now, but he was out in L.A. And that was during the time um, when Terry was out there. His parents were split, but... So I knew Terry and his mom. 
That's kind of it. So Bob, the guy, the lawyer from NBC who had hired me to play the Chasen's party, said, well, the son of, 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 a, of a, what, my math teacher out at Exeter, where he went to school, you know, one of those high-tone all-boys schools in New Hampshire, um, his son's out here, and he's kind of an aspiring singer-songwriter. And, you know, I think you two should know each other because he's been out here for a while now, and you should know him. And I, he says, is it okay if I give you his his name? Um, I give him your number to him. I said, sure. Well, lo and behold, now, again, we meet and we start going to these singer-songwriter um, workshops where, you know, you get some bird out rock and roll guy and you everything's like I said. You give them the, your demo, you pay 40 bucks. They put it in within the first 10 seconds of hearing it. Turn it off. Not enough of a hook. Next. You know, about your song. Not enough of a hook. Yeah. And so we would get mad. What the... And we, what the heck do they know? Blah, 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 blah. And we do one of two things after those workshops. We either go to a bar and order pictures of beer and tell, we're going to be great some year. Blah, blah, blah. Or we'd go to the C.C. Brown's, which was a great old ice cream parlor next to Grauman's Chinese that had the best hot fudge sundaes on the planet. So we drown ourselves, what, beer or hot fudge sundae? Uh-huh. Okay. Now, I'm not telling his name yet on purpose. So, you know, we're both there a year, we're struggling, we're doing our things, we're playing showcases, la, 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 but we do become very good friends. I moved back to Michigan after a year there. He stays probably another, almost a year, 10 months. Then he moves back to New Hampshire. Fast forward, uh, let's see, that was 1990, 91, 92. Fast forward to the early 2000s. I'm uh, on a plane going to Cincinnati uh, to play with Cincinnati Pops Outdoors, their big outdoor venue. On the plane ride from, um, where was I at that time? I was living in Chicago at that time. Um, and I'll tell you how I got there, but this is, this is again, the weird part of my life. I'm on the plane, and I'm looking at the, the plane magazine, and they have a column of the big hit books right now, the number one books. And the number one book, Fiction is called The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. And I'm going, oh, that can't be the Dan Brown that I know from L.A. I mean, yeah, he told me, you know, he wrote a little bit. and the, But no, that can't be. I said, but you know what? I'm sure Cincinnati has a bookstore. I'll go in and see. Because if it's him, there'll be a picture on the back flap of the yeah. cover. So sure enough, I get in, check the new hotel, I have time to kill, I go to Brent, there's a Brentano's bookstore in Cincinnati. I see they have a big pyramid stacked of the Da Vinci Code. Next to it is another big pyramid of uh, Hillary Clinton's book. So she's number one for nonfiction, he's number one for fiction. So I, I pull the book out and I turn to the back flap and it's Dan Brown. My friend from L.A., <laughs> the friend who always knew that I was good to make my mom's homemade spaghetti, and he was always good to have a frozen burrito in his microwave if we got hungry, because we were a little starving artist kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, he wrote the Da Vinci Code. Oh, my God. Wow. He, he will have, he won't remember. First of all, he'll have short-term memory. He, who? Kevin, who? What? There's no way. His life has exploded. So I go to the counter to buy the book, and I said, look, I would never do this, but I am so happy because I said, I'm so happy for this guy's success because he's one of the nicest people you would ever meet. And if you got to know him, you'd say he deserves every good thing that happens to him because he's just a super nice, down to earth person, kind as can be. So I say to the woman at the counter, I said, I said, see that picture? I know him. And I said, I'm not saying that for any other reason than he deserves this success. He's one of the nicest people you ever want to meet. So I'm thinking, okay, I do my concerts. I get back to Chicago. I'm going, how in the hell am I ever going to get in contact with Dan Brown? So I said, he's got to have a website. I go to the website. And so they have disclaimer. Dan Brown does not accept any personal messages. Blah, 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 blah. So I look and I see his publicist and then I see his literary agent. I thought, I'm going to send an email to his publicist. What do I have to lose? So I do. I said, hi, my name's Kevin Cole. I knew Dan Brown in his L.A. days. We were both you know, struggling singer-songwriters. I, I'm so happy for success. I'm not asking for anything other than if you'd like to get in touch with me, here's my info. If not, please tell him 
you know, congratulations, and I'm very happy for him. Within a half hour, I get an email back saying, Kevin, this is Blythe. Well, Blythe was somebody he met out there who worked for one of these songwriter promoter groups, and they, not too long after, got married. All right? She says, this is Blythe. I'm actually his publicist. You'll hear from Dan within the hour. I'm like, cool. He sends me an email within the hour, and the opening statement is this. (laughs) He said, how could I ever forget you, a person that plays Gershwin like a god? (laughs) he says of course i remember you so that started and i went your life must be just crazy you know all that so again wow serendipity so we're friends to this day when he wrote um was it the lost symbol he he uh, had me out to new york for the uh release of the book they had the huge party and all oh man it was very cool to be because he was the man of the hour you know and Mm -hmm. and he's you know but he and everyone, of course, was clamoring around him. And I'm just, you know, just little mouse kind of. So about an hour into that party for the Lost Symbol, he finally, he worked his way over to me. He says, I've been trying to come over to see you, you know. I said, I know. I said, Dan, this is your night. This is not about, he goes, no, no, that's not true. And he gave me a big hug and he said, look, this wouldn't mean anything if my families and, and friends that I care about weren't here. This would mean nothing. I went, oh, you just gave me a million dollars. Because that's how it should be. Mm. You can have all the success. You can win the lotto. All that stuff is fine and dandy. But if you don't have the people you love or care about there to share it with you, yeah, doesn't mean a hill of beans. Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So he's just, he's terrific. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've also uh, uh, struck up a friendship with... Uh, Marvin Hamlish, also, right? Yeah, that, again, is, is a weird thing. Over time, you start playing for all the major and, and first-tier, second-tier, third-tier orchestras in the country, all right? And two of my favorite orchestras are Minnesota Orchestra and San Diego Symphony, and I had played with them multiple times. Well, of course, I knew who Marvin Hamlish was and all of that, never dreaming I'd be meeting and working with him for the last eight years of his life, not knowing that it was the last eight years of his life. But what happened was this. I got a phone call from a woman, a very sweet elderly woman, um, for a summer music uh, festival at SPAC. And those initials stand for Saratoga Performing Arts Center in Saratoga, New York. And the Philadelphia Orchestra has a three-week summer residency there, not too far from the racetrack, okay, in Saratoga. Mm-hmm. She calls and says, oh, we need someone to play the Rhapsody in Blue on such and such date, and Marvin Hamlish will be conducting. Are you available? And I thought, yeah. So <laughs> I go, and as Marvin liked to tell the story, as he did in many of the concerts we did over eight years, I was I always show up early earlier than necessary for my first rehearsal with the orchestra. Sometimes you only get one because I want to try out the piano and just check things out. So they have the nine foot Steinway and I'm there plenty early. I think it was like eight, eight fifteen, and our rehearsal wasn't until 10 and I'm just playing. And as Marvin would like to tell the story, he, he said he came in cause it's a big outdoor venue. It's half covered and then the half is out on the lawn. Okay. So he comes in early while I'm playing, and I don't see him. He's at the back of the stage, and he thinks he hears two pianists. He thinks he hears two pianos playing. Of course, I'm using my arrangement of Gershwin's Fascinating Rhythm uh, as a warm-up to test, t- test out what the piano can do. And it, it, has, it does sound like I have a third hand, okay? I, I will admit that. <laughs> but, but anyway, I have no idea that anyone's coming in because I'm playing. And so he said he was rounding back of the stage and he's across a stage left from me and he says and i look over and i see one guy sitting at the piano he says you know i i actually bent down to see if there was a, a tape recorder <laughs> that he was playing with because it just it sounded humanly impossible that could be one person he said but it was one guy and then he'd say to the audience and because i play that as an encore after doing rap being blue with the orchestra this is what would crack me up. I get done playing Rhapsody Blue. It would always end the first half of the 
Gershwin evening that I did with Marvin Hamish for eight years all over the country. And, and he's, after I played Rhapsody Blue, big, big finish, blood, sweat, and tears, he calmed the audience down. He goes, you ain't heard nothing yet. Because he couldn't wait for me to play my two-minute fascinating rhythm, the piece that brought us together that he thought was even more oh, incredible man. than the Rhapsody of Blue. I'm like, oh, right. yeah, they had heard nothing yet. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, 16 and a half minutes of sweat. And the other, blah, blah. So then, he, then he'd, he'd say, you know, if, if he'd point to me, to, and, at, to the audience, he'd say, if he wasn't such a nice guy, I'd shoot him. And then he'd go, go ahead, hit it, kid. And then I'd play this fascinating rhythm. And he'd stand there and just beam because he just thought it was just the coolest thing. But that's how we met. And, and because apparently his agent told him year previous, Marvin, you need a Gershwin evening. Because he had all these pops evenings and he's going mm-hmm. all over the country. And uh, so he said, okay, well, get me something to, I'll put the raps down, get something to play it. So we did two nights at SPAC that summer. Um, and that would have been the summer, I want to say 2004. So I, I, after the first night, I said to him afterwards, I was dressing him, I said, um, and I couldn't call him Mr. Hamby. He said, it's Marvin. I said, okay. I said, okay, first of all, I said, who put us together? He goes, I'm not sure yet who recommended. Because somebody had to recommend me to his agent. And then Marvin just said, fine, because he had never heard of me. But then the second thing I said to him, I said, but Marvin, I said, you are a phenomenal pianist. I mean, he still holds the record. He was six years old when he was accepted at Julia. Oh, my Lord. I mean, he was a genius. Friend. I said, you could play and conduct like Leonard Bernstein did. He looked at me and goes, I don't want to work that hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, and I don't want to do this piece with any other pianist but you from now on. That's awesome. Which was, yeah, it was just like super cool. So oh. we finally figured out that the orchestra manager for San Diego and Minnesota both orchestras that Marvin had conducted with, that I had played with, they said, oh, if you're doing rap, you got to get Kevin Cole. So they had said, and that's how it happened. And then he became mentor and friend. And it's hard to believe that next year, it'll be 10 years that he's been gone because it was so unexpected. You know, but talk about, oh, I, I mean, just a guy who got into the business the way he did and, and but is so generous behind the scenes. Another one, like a Dan Brown, they have helped more people. Marvin Hamish has helped more people without any fanfare or people. Know. He he paid people hospital bills in towns he'd be in. We'd be performing because somebody would say at, meet him after. Oh my 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 brother's in the hospital. He's not doing good. Oh, if you could just stop and say he's a big fan, and then Marvin would end up paying his hospital. I mean, just wow. Ne- nobody ever knew. Right, right, right. Yeah, great Unbelievable. guy. Unbelievable. Great guy. Mm. The positivity just spreads itself around when it's all good. That's one thing that's held true for a lot of people we've had on the show here. It's uh, when uh, the kindness comes in, it pays itself back in returns that are well are serendipitous. Well, like you say. I, I've always felt that you know, with great talent comes great responsibility, or actually greater responsibility, because you're speaking for those who can't. You're connecting music. <sighs> with people from that come into a concert hall which which you're doing this live and a lot of them don't know what to expect they've never heard Kevin Cole what's that oh oh, he's Marvin Hamish well Marvin's always good for a good night Uh, or or when I'm just me and not Marvin so my job is not to win them over because a lot of times people say that there is there is a formula though to it Um, by the third piece or third song if if they're not with you, they're not going to be, okay? That holds true. I've never seen it fail. By the third song, they're either with you or they're not with you. Luckily, they've always been with me because you go out there and say, we're all going to have a good time. You don't, you don't get to say that, maybe, but you have to think that. So when you sit down at the piano, they see you enjoying it. and they, I've had it more times than once. People would say afterwards, I'm signing CDs. They go, do you know... What joy, how joyful it is to watch you play because you're having the best time. And so I, I'm just smiling because we don't see people mm-hmm. having that much fun. They're mm-hmm. so serious and they're in their world and it's beautiful, but you really look like, I said, how can I not smile and show on my face? I'm playing some of the best music ever written, happy stuff, powerful stuff. And my job is to just have you relax, plug into it, no matter how good or shitty your week was Mm -hmm. and so that you know you can get up tomorrow and do it all over again you know 
Yeah, it's it's, and I've had crews, um, stage managers and tech crews and whatnot at theaters say, "You're not like anybody else we get in here." And I say, "Well, how so?" Well, like you're sitting in the office talking to us about the Chicago Cubs, and then ten minutes later, you got to go on stage and like do this phenomenal thing, and then you come off stage and you're still talking to us. You don't know how many artists. We can't even look at them. They have it in their contract. <laughs> Crew cannot look at them. They have to get in their zone. And I said, look, first of all, if I don't know what I'm doing and haven't done my homework before I get here, they shouldn't have hired me. Now, when I walk out on stage, I'm business. I'm not all business. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I do my job. But I don't have to be, a, you know, horse's mm-hmm. backside when mm-hmm. I walk off stage. Because, let's face it, box office personnel and crew... If they like you, you're going to be asked back. Yeah. If they don't like you and you're asked back, you're going to have a lot of fun because <laughs> they're they're going to make your life pretty miserable. But no, I, I just, uh, yeah, either know what you do before you show up or mm-hmm. you can't think mm-hmm. it. <laughs> have you, uh, you've gone around doing all the Gershwin, obviously, and all the show tunes. Have you, how much of your own music have you had time to write? And how, have you put out records? And can you give well, us an idea of what you've done for yourself? I, in my solo concerts, I've been able to do much more of that um, because, um, well, when you're at the symphony orchestra, you got to have charts, you have to have orchestrations. Yeah. However, um, I had one of the songs. Lord, this is <laughs> this is kind of an interesting thing too. Okay, um, I was approached uh, many years ago now. That's got to be at least ten, maybe fifteen years ago, um, by the Ira Gershwin estate, George's brother, to do a CD of Ira Gershwin material. And I said to them, I said, "Well, okay, unlike George, Ira wrote the words, so." I'm going to have to sing on this if you want. I said, you know, you, you like my voice enough for me? Oh, oh yeah, you're fine. We were going to open up the, the, the vault and anything you want, whether it's been used or not, you know, unpublished, we'll, we'll, at, at your access. I said, fine. So just, you know, come up with your list and submit it and all that. So I did. Well, I knew there was a lyric that um, Ira had written that... Uh, was never set to music. Now, he's, every lyricist probably has a few of those lying around. Mm-hmm. He, I, Harold Arlen or Jerome Kern, I think, were supposed to write it, but it just didn't happen, so it got put aside. Also, on this, so I, I asked if I could set an Ira Gershwin lyric. Well, they had never let anyone do that. I mean, that's like asking to rewrite the Bible because yeah. he's one of the premier lyricists of our time Ira Gershwin but um, Robert Kimball um, who is the, the big consultant for the Ira Gershwin estate knew knew me knew my work and, and was the per, the go-between for all this said um, yeah they said go ahead on top of that um, there was a lyric that they had and Harold Ireland after George died, Ira needed to get out of his doldrums because George died in 37, and Ger- Ira lived, you know, till 1984, I believe it was. But anyway, um, so Kern and Harold Arlen, they started to write with Ira, just even songs, just stuff to get him back in the swing of things. Because, I mean, obviously, you, you, his brother, they were very close, and he's, you know, he's gone. So there was always this question about there was a, I remember Ed Jablonski playing for me a demo of Harold Arlen humming tunes uh, that they weren't lyrics for, or they were supposed to be, I don't know. But for some reason, when I read the lyric, I said, I really like this lyric. I said, I bet you it goes with this tune. So then I had to contact the Harold Arlen estate and say, look, there was a recording, it's a demo, blah, 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 blah. And they said, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. They sent it to me as an MP3, and by God, it fit with that lyric perfectly. Wow. So not only did they let me write a lyric to an, uh, excuse me, a music to an Ira tune, I was also <clears throat> able to put a new Harold Ireland Ira Gershwin thing together. <laughs> so, so that being said, they were very pleased with how it turned out. I was too because it has that flavor of of a tune that would be for a Fred Astaire or whatnot. All right. I'm doing a tribute to Ira Gershwin with Chicago Symphony at the Ravinia Festival. 
um, kind of what year was that? It's in the 2000s. I'll say it was around 2012, 11, somewhere like that. So I asked one of my orchestrator friends, I said, look, I'm going to need a couple orchestrations for this show I'm doing with performers at Ravinia Chicago Symphony. I said, would you orchestrate this tune? So for the very first time, I got to do one of my own songs, not only my own song, but with a lyric by Ira Gershwin. Thank you very much. Let's just start at the top. Oh, with the Chicago Symphony as you know the accompaniment. And uh, so that was quite a thrill, but... There, I have tons of material, and I'm at that point now because I haven't done a CD. In, well, the last one I did was by Margaret Hamlish Evening with the Kalamazoo Symphony. We released a CD of that, but it's time for me to start getting this material out there um, because, you know, I'm going to croak and <laughs> somebody's going to say, what's this? Wait, oh, are, are we grilling tonight? Okay, <laughs> start the coals with this. Oh, yeah. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric Kitsch, located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. They offer new and used records, including local to Michigan original vinyl and CDs, as well as clothing, electronic equipment, funky household items, music gear, and stringed instrument repair. You can find them on the web or call 989-402-1411. I, I just listened to your Christmas CD this morning. And you have a song on there about light being a light. Yeah, from the live concert yeah, and I you, did. Yeah, yeah. And you wrote Be the Light, right? yeah, and Sylvia McNair premiered that. Yeah, I, did, I wrote lyrics and music to that. Yeah, yeah it's not a bad tune. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, but I also, um, on my solo Christmas disc, which is piano, I have a piano instrumental on there called Your Gift that I kind of like. It's kind of Wyndham Hilly, I guess you could say if if people even know Wyndham Hill oh, anymore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's, you know, yeah, I have, a, I have plenty of stuff. I just, uh, again, marketing of all of this, but... Well, people don't buy CDs anymore. Well, either. no, you know, I mean, I do. Well, I just saw the Canadian Brass recently, and I bought three of their CDs because I don't stream music. I don't download, and I know I should. Everyone says, what? But I don't have to listen to music every day. And sometimes it's on purpose because if you're writing yourself, you, you, you don't you don't want to plagiarize, but but there's only so much influence. I'm like, my God, I've heard so much. I don't need any more vocabulary. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. so you get to a point. There's only twelve notes, okay? Mm -hmm. I, you know, just like like telephone numbers. I know the combinations, but but you're right. I need to get them out. But what's interesting is during this podcast with you is because. This is the first time I've ever on a podcast, oh. so you have that feather in your cap. But but come spring of 2022, I'm going to start finding my own podcast. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so <clears throat> many of these stories that I've touched on today will be elaborated on even further. But but more so that I also like want to take the cue from George Gershwin and allow up and coming. I know here I am, kind of a known unknown. But I, I but I want to help be a voice for up and coming songwriters because they're out there. Yeah, you know, uh, I, we're all part of a, you know, brother and sisterhood. That's that, how it keeps going. It it really does, <clears throat> and they have something to say. They, you know, melody exists, um, and and words are important. And you know, when when you think that ninety eight percent of all the songs ever written are about love. How many more ways can we write about love? Yeah. Think about it. There yeah. are very few songs that are not written about love in one fashion or another. The universal condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's either you have it or you don't. There's no in-between. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So what are we complaining about? When you were in love, it's not enough. When we're not in love, it's not enough. You know, it's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, but, but there's always a new twist, you know, on, on it. As, as, and... I think, too, because people have had more time to reassess where their life is because of COVID, because of being shut down or, you know, or in their own igloo, so to speak. I think they've had time to figure things out and, and what's important. And hopefully some of these people did it at an earlier age than I did. So they have longer yeah. to live 
the way they want to live. Because we have to say, oh, you know, people don't want to work. They're taking that money. They don't want to work. I said, no, I don't think that's it. I think a lot of people who had very good jobs said, I don't want to do that anymore. Sure. Or, yeah, or, or, or I want to do it differently. I want to be home more. I want to see my kids. I want to make breakfast for my kids. So, there's just something change. And it's not, it's not for the bad. It's actually for the good. You know, yeah, I, like I, taking that big breath. Yeah. You uh, know, why wait till the end of your life? Oh, I should have, or I could have, or I would have. You know, like, no. Just do that. You know, change it. Um, but uh, <laughs> we're going to see what happens with me because um, whatever happens, I've had a very rich life um, in the sense of the people I've met the people who've enjoyed my music, the people who I've been able to say thank you for enjoying what they created. I mean, I would have never, in my wildest dreams, thought I would be able to play for an Irving Berlin or a Harold Arlen and say thank you, you know, yeah. for the music you wrote. I mean, that's just... But that was in lieu of me going to university. Mm -hmm. I was at Jablonski's. He was the one that knew all these people. He used to want to say, you got to hear this kid. you got to hear blah, blah, blah. And so, oh, man. yeah. And, and so in lieu of that, I get to meet Yip Harburg, you know, the guy who wrote the lyrics and the script for The Wizard of Oz, you know, <laughs> countless other things, you know, and, and they're all funny stories because, you know, I was just this kid and they go, you remind me of George, oh my God, and they cry and gnash their teeth and you just go, I didn't mean to make you cry, no, it's a good thing, oh, you know, man. you know, they just, uh, I think in their mind and their eyes and ears too, they thought, well, here's somebody who's carrying this on when we thought it might be all done because once they go they, they truly most songwriters especially from the golden age maybe berlin knew because he lived beyond it and won but most of them had no idea of their legacy george gershwin especially he had he hoped things would live on after he went of course he didn't know he was going to die at 38 yeah but at the same time there was no guarantee because they, they didn't really sit and, how do I say, enjoy it. They were on to the next thing. They had to keep writing songs or, or songs from movies or works, whatever it was. They, this was their job. Yeah. Um, and they treated it that way, you know. Um, they didn't have any island to go to in a studio and hold themselves up for a year to make a record. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, they were writing things like this. That. And in fact, a lot of times, especially for film, They'd write three times the amount of songs that were needed for the film. And then maybe out of 40 songs, they only used seven in the movie, you know, so, <laughs> you know. Just incredible amounts of material. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's still st stuff left to be discovered. Gershwin was famous for, I think it happened, I know it happened once, it might have happened twice, having a suitcase, or a briefcase, I should say, full of stuff he was working on and left it in a taxi cab. Oh, my Lord. Oh. Wow. Still not found to this day. And when asked about it, he goes, well, I'll write more. Because, yeah. I mean, that's what you do. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. But you just know it's in somebody's attic somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got <laughs> tucked away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Give us a little rundown of your last few years. You were talking about when you got here. You've gone from stereo to mono. Oh, and uh, how does that affected your your position as a musician? Well... You can actually go online and see this 10-minute uh, video about my ordeal getting a brain tumor. Now, that's a brain tumor is what killed George Gershwin. So talk about irony. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's just, <laughs> you know, I go, okay, George, I've been accused of sounding like you. I've been accused of being you reincarnated. Couldn't you give me your cigar-smoking habit and not your tumor? <laughs> really? This is going a little too far, okay? So, so it, in a nutshell, what happened was uh, in the year 2017, starting January to November, little things were happening that just seemed odd to me. Like, I'd go to the movies, and I noticed my right ear. I was, like, cupping my ear because it wasn't clear. I, like, I was having trouble with my right ear a little bit. Um, the right side of my face felt a little numb, like it had been shot with Novocaine. The right side of my tongue started losing its taste. And every once in a while, I'd be standing, talking to somebody, and I'd lose my balance, and I wasn't moving. So I thought, oh, these things. But I kept feeling a blockage on the right side of, uh, from the ear down, the, you know, along the uh, jawline. 
Mm-hmm. So I thought maybe I have a sinus and some kind of infection, ear infection. So I went to see my ENT in Saginaw, and this was just before Thanksgiving of 2017. He said, have you ever had an MRI? I said, no, just, you're going to get one. Got the MRI after Thanksgiving, went in to get the results. And now I did a dumb thing. I went myself. Never go for test results without somebody with you. Okay? I learned my lesson. I go into his office. I'm sitting there. About five minutes later, he walks in and he says the statement that you never want to hear unless you're watching a soap opera like General Hospital. He says this, I wish I had better news. Oh. And I'm looking at him like, did he just say that? Like, It's not registering quite. Like, you have a schwannoma or what's known as an acoustic neuroma. It's one of the largest ones I've ever seen. Um, you need to call the Michigan Ear Institute right now. Uh, ask for Dr. Babu. And he, you know, he's the one that would, will take care of this because you have to get this out as soon as possible. So I try to process this, what he just said to me, because I'm feeling okay other than these little annoyances. I said, did, okay, did I just hear you right? Boil it down. I have a brain tumor. Yes. And I have to call this Michigan Ear Institute that I've never heard of that's down in Novi, Birmingham, whatever. And they're going to have to operate and get this out of me. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm glad we know what it is. But second, if you had what I what you had what I have in my head right now is Doctor Babu the person you'd be going to. He goes absolutely. That's what I, you need to hear. All I need to know. So I go to my car and I am ready to lose it. I'm like, oh, I said, but you can't lose it. You have to call them right now. You have to go see. It. So I'm just I could feel it. It's like a volcano. I was already just burst into tears and I just. I swore at myself and said, you don't have effing time with us right now. And then all of a sudden, it just like vacuumed away. It just went out of my body like an exorcism. I called there. This was on a Monday. They said, we have an 8.30 uh, Wednesday appointment open. I said, fine, I'll take it. Leeds Bird drove me down. Two of us, because it leads. <laughs> now, he has hearing aids, too. And I know I was starting to have compromised hearing. I said, well, between the two of us, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so we go down. Uh, they have the MRI. They send in an assistant first, uh, somebody who's interning and learning and all this stuff. And so he's talking to me. And, and he's young. And it's all good. But, you know, he says, well, do you need to know this? And I, have you seen your MRI? I said, well, Dr. Babu will probably show it to you. Blah, 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 blah. So... Finally, Dr. Babu comes in, very nice, and he says, Let's, let me show you your MRI. So he gets to the machine and he shows it to me, and I had never seen one. And it's, of course, it's my brain, and it's my skull. So he's going down. It's like an elevator to hell because it's going <laughs> down, down, down. And each time he says, now watch that little black dot. And as he's peeling away the layers of my brain, down, 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 it's getting bigger and bigger till it looks like the map of Asia on, a, on the game board of risk. And he said, that's your neuroma. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He says, and you see that little thing that looks like a little shadow up there? He says, not a shadow. That's your neuroma trying to get into your brain. And once it does that, it's going to travel to the base of your neck and kill you. But we're not going to let that happen. <laughs> so in my head, I'm going, Gershwin's tumor was at, that it wasn't a short neuroma. It was a different type, but it was at the base of his neck. That's what killed him. And I'm like, George, you can't not be doing this to me. Now, I know I'm older than you were, but this is nuts. Whoa. Is there something from playing your music that creates a tumor in your head? You know, I mean, what's going on? So we go into the room, uh, at consulting room, and, and Dr. Uh, Babu says to me, he goes, okay. Because I got, he says, this is very serious. He says, but we're going to take care. I said, well, doctor, I have to tell you something before you go any further. You need to know what I do for a living. Because I've read on your website that there's a possibility I'll lose some my hearing. You know, once you take this out, I may not have hearing, and it's on my right side. Right? But I'm a concert piano, blah, 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 blah. And he says, and he looked at me after I told him, he goes, you're world famous, aren't you? I said, not really world. I, I played around the world, but I, I said, I'm known in inner circles. He goes, and you're very good at what you do, aren't you? I said, yeah, I kind of am. He goes, okay. He goes, well, I'm going to tell you something. He goes, there's five things, my criteria for this. He goes, number one, um, we want you to be alive. So I want to save your life. That's number one. Number two, I want you to have full mobility of your facial muscles because 
it, you can get paralyzed for life if, if we can't get this all out because this is a rather large tumor. So in fact, um, it's probably been growing in your head for 15 years. Oh, my Lord. So I'm thinking, okay, 2003, I played the Hollywood Bowl for two nights. Neuroma was with me on the bench. Um, you know, I'm going down to my... Mm-hmm. I played Carnegie Hall in 20, 2013. Oh, the Neuroma was with me. We were playing duets. How nice. So I'm like, okay. So then he goes, okay, so that's two. Then he goes, the third one is, um, I want you to... What was... Okay, let's see. We got Save Your Life, Full Facial Mobility. Oh, then then um, <clears throat> I want you uh, to be able to... Uh, walk without any problem because it can affect balance uh fourth is i think that was the hearing so I'll, I'll try to save as much as the hearing as i can and i forgot what the fifth one is but anyway after he said them he goes can you live with that and i said yeah because i want to live because that's what i want to hear <clears throat> so i was going to belgium to play with an orchestra there for new year's program i think it was like january 3rd and 4th and so i said can i fly because i'm supposed to, in, in less than a month I'm just, oh yeah i said oh one other thing i said this is my first time to brussels i said and they're known for two things beer and chocolate he goes have all you want i said okay <laughs> <laughs> i said i plan on it thank you very much i saw a lot of the pink elephant while i was there uh so <laughs> so anyway but I'm just thinking, uh, and we'll schedule this as soon as we can get it in. Well, right at that point, they didn't have an opening until like May. And I'm like, this is, this is December. I, said, I can't wait that long. So I said, please let me know when you have an opening. So they finally did. It was in March. I think it was March 18th or 19th. Went down to uh, St. John's Hospital in Novi. And, uh, oh, he told me it's an eight-hour operation unless there are complications that it can go 12 to 16 hours, because but we don't want that to happen. Had the operation, eight hours almost to the minute. I had given him a CD of me playing Gershwin, because I hear they play music while they're operating. Mm-hmm. I, I keep forgetting my, the other doctor's name, because Babu opens you up, gets you ready, then the other doctor removes the tumor, and then Babu oh. sews you back up. But but anyway, he played my CD, which is also, one of them is also a Gershwin, with Raps being blue. When it got done, he told me this later. The other doctor came in. He goes, "Okay, you got to hear this. Play it again." So he's listening to it as he's doing it. So at least they they kind of knew what I did while they're taking this out. Yeah. So very next day in the hospital after the operation, um, the doctor comes in and he says, "Textbook." He said, "This couldn't have gone better." He goes, uh, "So we have that in our favor." He said, the second thing um, is um, we got it out at the right time. And I looked at him and I said, because originally he said it wasn't going to make a move probably till July or August of 2018. And I said, you don't have to say anything, but you're st- I wouldn't have had that much time. He goes, no, you wouldn't have. I oh, my Lord. So I said, okay. So then the physical therapist comes in because, you know, they're used to people taking a year, could even be two years of physical therapy and whatnot. So, you know, I'm all IV'd up and then blah, blah, and all this. Stuff. I said, well, before we take a walk with the walker and the belt and all this, I have to go to the bathroom. He says, okay, come on. We'll take all your stuff with you. So, you know, I'm standing up, taking care of my number one. And he goes, oh, you're doing that pretty good. She says, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, we're going to walk... And he said, you're going to use the walker. and um, But, oh, no, wait a minute. How did that work? He goes, oh, I, I don't think you need the walker. He says, I'm just going to hold on to you with the belt as we go. Because we're going to walk to where the room we're going to put you in. Because you're an ICU. We're going to put you in a regular room. But we're just going to walk the hall. He said, then we're going to be going by the nurse's station, just so you know. So behave. I said, okay, <laughs> fine. So he's holding on to the belt. And I walk out. And I'm just walking. And- you know, get my bearings, and I'm not falling over or anything. I get to that room, he, uh, outdoor, uh, the door of the room, and he goes, wow, you did that so well. I want you to walk back to your old room, and I'm not going to hold on to you. And I turned to him, I said, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? He goes, yeah, it is. I said, okay. <laughs> so I'm walking without any assistance, and he, as we walk past the nurse's station, he goes, here comes the stud muffin walking all alone. Here comes the stud muffin. <laughs> Oh, I said, God, and I got these nurses for the rest. I said, don't do that. So we get back to the room. And he, and, and I think his name was 
I want to say it was Pete, but that's not right. At any rate, he goes, look, I have been doing physical therapy for 24 years and mainly with acoustic door over patients. I have never had anyone do what you just did. He said, it's, it's virtually impossible. He said, I, I, I don't know how you're doing this. And he said, I got to talk to your surgeons because he said, this is, I'm, he said, but I'm going to be back tomorrow because I got to take you to the uh, PT room and you got to do the car door thing and you got to go up the steps and all that. I said, fine, because I had done all this with my mom and she was sick, so I knew the routine. So he comes back the next day, takes me to the PT room. I do all that flying colors, no problem. He goes, I'm signing off. You don't need any PT. He goes, I said, are you serious? And my friend Sylvia McNair was there and so she put, Filmed a lot of this on her iPhone. I've still yet to see it from this day. I don't know if I want to look at it, but he said, this is nothing short of a, is a miracle. He said, and I was talking to your surgeons, and here's the only thing we can figure out. When these things were happening to you over the 15 years, because of the way your brain is wired because of music, every time something was going to be a hindrance, your brain went around it and rewired. Wow. He said, because seriously, the symptoms you were having last year should have been much more severe. I played a concert with Sylvia McNair the Saturday before the Monday I had the operation. And there's no way I should have. Now, compromised hearing, yes. But he, but this is the thing. They had to sever the hearing nerve uh, from the right ear mm. in order to get, because of the way the tumor was, it was wrapped around that. Oh. So all the mechanism, my hearing mechanism for my right side is there but there's nothing connecting it to my brain. So I'm hoping the next 10 years with advancements in nanoscience, yeah. that they'll figure out a way, just put that extension cord from my hearing uh, mechanism to my brain and I could get it back, but we'll see. But anyway, um, wow. now I, the other thing that was really crazy, this is the great amen to this story, <clears throat> is I only had to cancel one solo concert for during the recoup time. Because it, you know, it'd be at least eight weeks of recoup because you know, I got a big bandage on my head and all that stuff. I got to heal. But I had one concert <laughs> that I refused to cancel. It was with the Albany Symphony in New York with David Allen Miller, <clears throat> who's my favorite Gershwin conductor, along with Benjamin Zander, Boston Field. They're my two best. But David and I have been doing Gershwin together for over 20 years. He conducts the Albany Symphony and we were doing an all Gershwin concert. And I had agreed. Originally, there was going to be two concerts, but because of contracts and rehearsal time being shortened, it could only be one. So I agreed, before I knew I had this tumor, to play all four piano works of Gershwin in one evening. And no one has ever done that. So you're doing Rhapsody, Blue Concerto, and F Variations, and I Got Rhythm, and the second Rhapsody all in one night. It's, it's the Olympics of piano. Yeah. You do it. Okay, let alone... I had, once I knew I had this tumor and all this stuff, I said, oh, I got to let David know. But I didn't call him until two weeks before the operation. I said, hi, David. He goes, hey, everything okay? I said, yeah. Um, I, they were talking about the concert and blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, and by the way, I said, in two weeks from now, I'm having major brain surgery, but don't worry, it'll be fine. And he goes, what? He goes, are you serious? He says, well, we'll just make an orchestra concert. You shouldn't be doing it. I said, no, no, here's the deal. I need a goal. Eight weeks from the day of the surgery to the concert, I said, if I can only play Rhapsody in Blue, that's what you get. If I can only play two pieces, I said, you get whatever it is. It's fine. Well, I did the concert. I played all four pieces, two encores. No problem. Unbelievable, man. Yeah, it was crazy. That oh. was just, like, crazy. Because everyone was like, you could just see the orchestra. Because they all knew what was going on. And I walk on stage for the rehearsal. And, you know, they're like, is he going to be able to do it? And now, again... I only had my left ear. Yeah. And the weird thing about it is you can figure out, okay, the way the piano's built, the lid is tilted. It projects the sound of the piano into the hall. So I always use my right ear when I'm playing with the orchestra. The, the sound for the piano comes to my right ear. The orchestra's on my left. You know, this 80 to 100-piece orchestra. So, you know, I can create the balance and know how to gauge my dynamics to the room. and all Yeah, that. Okay. yeah. Well, now, in order for me to hear the piano, it has to boomerang the walls of the hall and then come around and get to my left ear. Well, guess what it's fighting with? 
this 80 or 100 piece orchestra that's going so it's like a funnel and everyone's fighting for space yeah so I have to go, come on, piano. I know you're in there. Come on, piano. But but it made me reass- reassess what I do. Because like, I, I never <coughs> wanted to really know. I just do it. I've always done it. Why, why would I analyze it? So I finally had to analyze it. And I thought it was 80% hearing, 20% physical. No. It's 50-50. I know how to play my loudest louds or my softest softs by touch alone, whether I can hear it or not. I didn't know that. I, I mean, my body knew that. I didn't recognize it. So now, knowing that, when I went to play, because I didn't touch the piano for three and a half weeks after the surgery. I was, I was staying at my cousin and his wife. They lived down in Northville. <clears throat> so they were only nine miles away from the doctors rather than driving back and forth from Bay City. And I didn't, they didn't have a keyboard, so I had to buy a keyboard, have it sh- shipped down to them, and I'd walk past it every day for three and a half weeks. I said, I'll get to you. I get you. I'm coming. I'll get mm-hmm. you. So I sat down, this electric, you know, Clavinova thing, and played a section of the Rhapsody. My main concern was not so much the hearing that I didn't hear, was would I feel the same inside creating and making music as I did yeah. before I lost half of my hearing? That was crucial to me. Uh-huh. I mean, would it change the way I feel and connect to the music I'm making? Right. It didn't. It didn't change it. it. I didn't. I'll never hear it the same, but I could still feel it the same. Wow. So then I thought, you're going to be okay. You're just. You're going to be okay. Yes, there's going to be challenges, and sometimes it is depending on the orchestra. Do you, Do you put a monitor up? What do you do for yourself? No. What I need to do. I have hearing aids. I have these very expensive hearing aids, which you may have noticed. I do not have in tonight. <clears throat> my bad, but they're not quite regulated to the way I need them to be for the dynamic range of a piano. We can do it. We just haven't done it. What what I need to do is sit in a hall, and it'll probably happen at U of M, at a big concert grand, and then they have their laptop. Oh. And as I play, they... Dial you in. Yeah, they, they check all the parameters. and Because the dynamic range of a piano is huge. Yeah. When I have my hearing aids in now and I start playing, after 10 minutes, the piano starts to sound a little wonky. It starts to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, mm. But these hearing aids that I do have also can be um, individually uh, mixed. You know, like you see people putting yeah. hearing pieces in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, it's already built into these little tiny oh, things. Man. I just okay. haven't done it. So I need to do it, obviously. So you can, you can, it's, I got you. It's, yeah. it's, it's like the private personal monitors nowadays that, yeah. that singers use. Yeah. I get you, yeah. Wow, what's your, what's on your what's on your platter for the year coming up here, twenty twenty two? Doing a recording uh, with Sylvia McNair of unknown Harold Arlen tunes, um, which I'm excited about because we, uh, you know, other than that live Christmas recording we did from St. Stan's, um, we don't have something like that. So, and I knew Harold Arlen, you know, the guy that, you know, wrote "Get Happy" and "Over the Rainbow" and "The Man Who Got Away" and all that stuff. So that I'm excited about. <clears throat> uh, I'll be back with the Albany Symphony. Excellent. <laughs> my, my good luck orchestra. Uh, and of, uh, well, let's see. Well, I might have already done that by this time that we're talking here. Because that's in February. Okay. Doing Gershwin. But we're going to do uh, the actual jazz band version of the Rhapsody Blue, the original. Which I haven't done that much. So that's that should be a lot of fun. Uh, what else is going on with me? You're going to do your podcast, you said? Uh, the, yeah, and just just watching and seeing what you're doing here mm-hmm. is giving me ideas. Uh, is that going to be also an outlet for you to put out your own original music through that? Yes, sir. I, I, okay, I kind of gathered that when you said that earlier. Yeah, and, and I do I do want to record um, and, and get, well, first of all, get the recordings I already have in CD form streamed. Okay, number one. Yeah. Oh, but I do have a new recording out that is streamed of the Concerto in F. That's been getting a lot of good reviews because um, um, we're using the original restored versions of all these Gershwin works. U of M Gershwin Initiative is this organization within University of Michigan that got a ton of grant money and they're restoring all, everything George Gershwin ever wrote, Damn. starting with the concert works. They've done Porgy and Bess, American in Paris, Concerto and F. So I made the first recording of that. Mm. So it's as close to what he without editors because once he died 
everyone wanted to stick their name on his music. Oh yeah. Edited by, but but and and because a lot of times when he would orchestrate something, it was not orchestrated like the way the standard way people orchestrate. They were unusual voicings and chords and things. So what happened after he died? Some of these so-called orchestrators went in and wanted to legitimize mm-hmm. and make it more standard for symphony orchestra. And I remember Ed Jablonski when he knew they were doing this. He'd say, he said to me, he goes, better Gershwin mistakes than some hacks improvements. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, so now we're getting back to the real real deal. Going so back to working. Yeah, from. that's kind of exciting. Well, and also I'm doing a lot of prep work, and we'll start getting the word out to orchestras and concert venues for the centennial of the Rhapsody in Blue in 2024. I mean, it's two years away. Oh, wow. And they're, they're already booking 20. 23, 2024, I'm getting calls already. So, but I want to do a legitimate tour. I don't want to just do one nighters, mm-hmm. which I've done my whole life. So, I'm working with the producer right now to set this up because also in 2024, it's the 80th anniversary of uh, Marvin Hamlish's birth. <laughs> so, and I have programs, you know, those are my two specialties. So, if I don't make enough money in three years of touring to have a retirement, I'm no good. <laughs> you know, that's my 401k. Yeah. <laughs> K stand means keyboard. Kevin. Kevin K. Cash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kevin Cole, thank you for everything you've brought to the world of music. I mean, you've, you've taken it from the earliest to now. You're right out of our area. You're a Michigan born. Everything uh, we do through the podcast here is just, it's touched the world. And uh, you're, you, what you've brought tonight is something we haven't brought here yet. And uh, thank you for what you well, continue to do. My goodness. Well, I I know I, uh, I'm very long-winded here, but I, I hope it's... Well, we got room for another podcast down the road. I'm always, oh, I, I've invited everybody yeah. back. So we got well, we, we to do those, we got to do the stories where you tell these goofy little ones in between. Well, how I, I still, more I, connectors. I, I didn't tell you about Muhammad Ali. Right, right, so right, right, right. right, right. Ones, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> from all of us at the podcast, we want to thank Kevin Cole for coming in. And uh, we will talk to you here in 2022. All right. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week posted every weekend. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredreif.com and the electric kitsch at electrickitch.com. This podcast wouldn't be here without special help from Studio 163's Alan Garcia, our podcast videographer and wingman, Mr. Mike Beatty, MMHP tagline specialist, Mr. Eddie Switek, and of course, Gary Johnson, Fred Reif, the electric kitsch, and all of our special guests, and especially you listeners. We want to thank you. You've been listening to the MMHP and the 989. From all of us at the podcast, we want to thank you for tuning in. I brought my yearbook for you to sign. <laughs> you can write, like, stay cool or something. <laughs> <laughs> can I write the way all those years back? later? Is that what you're asking for? <laughs> oh, my God. Don't get to look up your picture in there. Oh, this is great. See, no, nobody else has signed that. I never had people. My freshman year, serious? I had three people sign the yearbook, and they approached me about doing it. I never asked them. Are you serious? Yeah, I remember it was uh, Jack Tobias, Laurie Race, and Connie Davitsky. <laughs> oh, okay, wait a minute. Uh, is this from the year you graduated? No, no, that I think is my... S- this is 76, right? 70. No, I think that's 75.